Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So thank you for coming today. And am I audible to everyone behind? Clear? Okay. So I'll be yeah. <clears throat> speaking on the topic of relationships and how we can improve them. So I'll tell right in the beginning the basic point and everything will be the elaboration of that point. Whenever people complain that they have a headache, quite often they have a stomach ache. <laughs> what I mean by this is that often whenever there are relationship issues, the surface issue and the actual issue are two different things. And we keep treating the headache and we keep treating the headache. See, I have done so much treatment, but why is the headache not going away? Because the headache is not the problem. The stomach ache is the problem. So I will talk about a story from the Srimad Bhagavatam. This story also comes in the other Puranas with slightly different uh, stress or or <clears throat> or variations. But overall, this is the story in the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which illustrates how relationships can go south and what can be done to avoid that. So the story of Daksha Prajapati. Okay, I think let's keep fixed at one level. Mm -hmm. It is okay what we had earlier, I think. Okay, it seems a little louder, or maybe I am away. Okay. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay. Is comfortably audible for me? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> So this is a story where Daksha Prajapati and his wife and his daughter Takshayani, they got completely alienated from each other. So sometimes the scripture teaches us what to do by showing what happens when we don't do what we should do. That means there can be good, good examples and there will be good, bad examples. That means something is a negative example, but it is a good example in the sense that it very vividly illustrates the principles over there. So, <clears throat> the story begins with, okay, the story begins with uh, Daksha Prajapati performing yajna. Now the Bhagavatam broadly describes a universe which is multi-level and <clears throat> the earth is one level and beyond that there are other levels also. So once Srila Prabhupada was asked, is there life on other planets? And Prabhupada said, of course. Why would Krishna waste so much space? <laughs> we see on the earth if it is small crack on the ground, we will see some ants or some insects inside that. So, we see if the earth is so densely populated, why would there not be life elsewhere? All that we can say with our today's reductionistic approach of science is, life as we know it has not been discovered on other planets. Now, although scripture talks about many things, which may, to a rational mind, seem difficult to believe. Okay, there's a heavenly planet, or there are demons, or there are talking monkeys, or whatever. Now, the point of scripture is to focus on action. That means, if you look at, if you look at demons, you know, so Ravan uh, can have ten heads. But he can be a very powerful demon. But still that doesn't mean he can do everything. There are certain things he can do, certain things he can't do. And the basic principle is that everybody throughout their life 
tries to address their desires within their limitations if you want to understand our life anyone's life basically we all have certain desires and we have certain limitations now the particular desires we have may be different the particular limitations we may have we have may be different but broadly how to address our desires within our limitations that is the essential principle or that is essential thread that describes everyone's life story and the details vary of course and they can vary quite dramatically but any story if we want to consider broadly speaking the person in a particular situation that situation is disrupted because of a particular reason say okay, the situation is disrupted because there is something wrong with that situation and when they are disrupted then they get into an unstable situation and when from that unstable situation they try to come back to a more evolved stable situation so that is the if you consider ramayana ram is in ayodhya it's a stable comfortable situation but it's eruption which he said to the forest and then there is conflict and then ravan is brought down and then ram and sita are united and they come back so the point is that beyond the specifics of the limitations beyond the specifics of the situations the principles that are given in the scripture about how to act and how not to act those are universal and even arjuna's question at the start of the bhagavad gita is about that prachami tvam dharma sammule chetah i am asking you what is dharma and dharma essentially is the right course of action that action which will keep us in harmony with our nature and the nature of reality so <clears throat> when we look at any story we can look at it from different perspectives if somebody is very rational and skeptical say hey, this doesn't make sense this doesn't make sense and this this is all people might say this is just fantasy this is mythology somebody else might look at the story and say hey, this is there's a lot of action a lot of drama a lot of entertainment in the story you may like that or we can look at the story in terms of what it talks about how people respond in various situations and then what we can learn from that so basically scripture is not there are two kinds of studies you could say there's a study of matter and there is the study of what matters <laughs> the study of matter is about the study of objective reality what really exists but study of mat what matters is what is really important for us and say for example now you are in this room if tomorrow uh, morning or after somebody asks you can you describe this room you would probably describe oh you know there was a big hall with many chairs and there was a some kind of improvised dais where the speaker was sitting and uh, <clears throat> there was a kids room behind now you could actually describe say the room had how many probably maybe 25 tube lights now how many of us would even notice that if we were in the profession of being a electrician you would surely notice that but otherwise we would notice that it says that even the most cleanly painted wall if you look at it very carefully on an average wall you can find about 100 to 200 marks but that doesn't matter to anyone so in general whenever we look at anything we basically look at it not in terms of what it is i'll ask what matters to me that means when you come into this room unless we are into uh, house construction we are not so much concerned about what the how building is made up of but what does it matter okay if you need a chair to sit on is it a comfortable chair is it a chair with a backrest is it is the acoustics of the room good 
So basically, when we look at the world, we don't focus on matter as in what matters. And what matters means, say, if you come here for a class, then what will help you get along the way and what will get in your way? So the two main things you focus on. Get along your way means, say, if you want to hear the class attentively, then what would be the best way to, maybe you should sit ahead, or maybe you sit where the acoustics are very good. And what will get in your way? Maybe if you sit some, to, next to somebody who keeps nudging you and whispering something and or who don't doesn't switch off their phone and the phone keeps ringing, then you may decide, okay, I don't want to sit with this person. So basically, if you look at our life, the way we function, our focus is always on what matters. So when you are in this room, what matters is, okay, what can help you get along the way to hearing attentively, what will get in the, your way of atten hearing attentively. And that's how we look at everything. And now matter matters, but only to the extent it comes along our way. It either helps us or it impedes us. <coughs> so <clears throat> now when we look at the scriptures, so I'm going, why I'm giving this background is, in this story, there are many things which might strike us as what's going on over here. But we need to keep our focus. So basically, Daksha is going to perform a sacrifice. Now these sacrifices uh, were as much religious, religious events, religious ceremonies as they were social events. And social events means that when, when a large number of people are coming, then if some very important people are coming, they are specially greeted, their names are announced, they are given special seats, and other people are also given seats. But if there is a social event, there is a hierarchy in it. Who is given what position, who is given how much attention. So the, when, so the, when the sacrifices are performed, the whole idea of sacrifices is, see, religious activities are not meant to be simply religious activities. There is also idea of socially coming together and seeing everyone. So Daksha, when he was going to perform the sacrifice, he was going to do a yajna. But while doing the yajna, he also wanted, he also invited all the devtas. And the yajna is basically a way in which we offer what is dear for us to something higher than us. So it could be ghee, it could be grains, but we offer that to something higher as a matter of sacrifice. So now there were various devtas who were also given the sacrifice and the Supreme Lord was also given the sacrifice. Now when the devtas were given these sacrifices, they all had particular seats where they would seat, they would be seated and the sacrifice would be performed for them. So then everybody was appropriately seated and honored and then Daksha came after that. In some cases, you know, sometimes if the program is being organized, the organizer might themselves be there to receive everyone. But if the organizer is a very big person, they may have their assistants who may receive them and the organizer comes later. So Daksha, he considered himself to be a very big person. So when he came, everybody got up. Everybody got up. But two people didn't get up. Does anyone know who are the two people? Yeah. And? Shiva and Brahma. Yes, thank you. So, what happened was, now Brahma of course was much older to him. He is like a father figure for him. And therefore, he was, he said, he didn't mind. But Shiva, what happened was, Shiva was absorbed in thoughts of Vishnu. And he was absorbed in thoughts of Vishnu and he didn't get up at that time. Now what happens that each of us, when we do certain things, so Yajna was a soul, as I said, it's a religious ceremony, but for him it was also a prestige issue. So when uh, we are interacting with people, different people have different needs. Now we could say it's a need of the ego or it's a need of the heart or whatever. 
but they have a particular need and if that need is not fulfilled of course we may not be needed, needed to fulfill that need somebody else can fulfill it or it need not be fulfilled also but the point is when that need is not fulfilled then people overreact so whenever we are interacting with people you know, we may be talking with them dealing with them courteously or whatever we need to try to ask us ask ourselves what is the need of the person and this understanding this is the to un, so this was i'm going to talk about relationships what i'm going to talk about understanding each other or understanding others the first point is understand what is the need of the other person so his need was not just to have all these big people come for the sacrifice his need was also that they should all respect me now we are all related with each other in various ways say for example mm, there is a there is a devotee in india mm, i mean he told me about his story that you know he had he became a devotee and then after that his father became a devotee and his grandfather became a devotee and he was young so then when now then after he became a devotee he became initiated and then after that his father also got to initiate his grandfather also to initiate so then so then when the initiation was happening his spiritual master told him say so your grandfather is now your god brother and not just your god brother he is laugh and says your grandfather is your junior god brother <laughs> <laughs> now now if you could say in the material relationship the grandfather is much much older than us and our grandfather is person whom we should respect now from the spiritual perspective we say oh i was initiated 5 years before or 10 years before or whatever now we could relate with different people in different ways and sometimes we might emphasize one particular relationship but another one particular dimension of the relationship and others might interfere might emphasize another dimension of the relationship so in the cosmic hierarchy brahma shiva and vishnu are the highest of the devas and daksha is relatively junior of course he's prajapati so in that sense for shiva to get up when daksha has come is not required but daksha was thinking of that relationship not in terms of the overall position in the cosmic hierarchy he was looking at the relationship in his immediate relationship and daksha had given his daughter in marriage to shiva so he felt that i am the father in law and he is my son in law and in that sense in the relationship he is junior to me so first of all itself he wanted to, he had done this whole ceremony not just to get religious piety but to get prestige and respect and on top of that he expected that from shiva because he saw that relationship first so what happens when we relate with people we can relate in different dimensions but we all need to understand in what direct what is the need of the person so of course lord shiva did not deliberately neglect him but he was absorbed in thoughts of vishnu and he was offering in his mind respects to vishnu so daksha took great offense how dare you not respect me and then he started to speak something now sometimes when people say i don't i don't mean to offend you <laughs> if somebody says that you can almost be sure that what they are going to say after that is going to be offensive <laughs> so quite often we give a disclaimer <laughs> and then do the very thing which we are claiming we are not doing now of course our intentions may not be like that but what happened daksha first thing he said is i am not 
I am not worried about my own prestige and pride. I am concerned about the ways of cultured people. And cultured people know how to respect, how to honor each other. And Daksha, by not getting up, sorry, Shiva, by not getting up, has shown us that he is utterly uncultured. Now, if you may say that, okay, you didn't get up, why make such a big deal out of it? See, whenever anybody makes some a big deal out of it, we can tell them, keep it small. But for them, if that was their need primarily, and if that is not addressed, then they just go crazy. So, in this case, his need was for his glory to be recognized, his prestige to be recognized. And when that doesn't happen, he just, he just goes in a tirade, <coughs> criticizing Shiva left, right. And when this happens, Shiva just decides that this is going crazy. He just walks away from there. He doesn't at all respond. Now when sometimes people get angry, people just lose track, what is the best way to respond? It's very difficult to decide at that time. But in general, whenever somebody is angry, to try to reason with them at that time is very difficult. And to try to counter attack them, counter their, it also doesn't work. Now this is not to walk away at all times, but sometimes when the provoke, other person is too provoked and no discussion is possible, that might be the best way. Because at least at that time, things don't get escalated. And later on the person may calm down and things may be addressed. So anyway, this, uh, when Daksha saw she was walking away, he felt even more angered. Now what happens? We see people from our perspective. And now Shiva's thought was, he's gone, he's just gone mad now. Let me not try to, he can't, I can't reason with him. And so he walked away. But at that time, Daksha thought, he is, first he has committed an offense and without apologizing, he is walking out. So it just reinforced his own idea about what he was doing. This is quite a problem. See, anger gives us the conviction of certainty. This is how it is. When we are angry, we feel, I know this person is like this and this is like this. And he just he thought, I know everything. When people are angry, they just go, they just go mad. I was at one conflict resolution meeting and, and mediation and then there are two people. So one person came and said to the other person, I know you are angry with me. The other person, I am not angry with you. Anger is an expensive emotion and you are not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, there are very many different ways of destroying any attempt at reconciliation. <laughs> but this is probably among the most cold hearted ways. <laughs> so sometimes it happens that we just have our own understanding of things and we live within that. So, anyway, this incident ended. Now when Shiva went away, then of course Parvati also, uh, Dakshani also went away with him. And then after some time, Daksha was going to perform another sacrifice. So the first point is whenever, like overall theme I am going to talk about is, when people have a, people complain of a headache, they have a stomach ache. So the problem here was not just that apparently Shiva didn't get up. It was Daksha who felt that his need to be respected had not been addressed. And he said one more point over there, our relationship with each other, our interactions are like, there are multiple levels of complexity. 
in the relationships. So he had felt originally that Shiva was not a worthy son-in-law for him. He had thought that his daughter is so beautiful and Shiva is so poor and he is not even very... Uh, he doesn't live in a clean place, he doesn't seem to have clean habits. He couldn't understand what Shiva was doing. So because of that, he already felt that he was unworthy and then he also seemed to behave in an unworthy way. So the next time when he did a sacrifice, he invited everyone. But he chose not to invite Shiva. And of course that meant he did not invite his daughter Dakshani also. And normally if there is a social event, a major social event, everybody comes to know about it. Hmm. So then Dakshani, she told uh, Shiva that you know, there is a sacrifice, let us go there. Let us go there. And Shiva said, we have not, we've not been invited. Let's not go. So, so then Dakshani said, we don't need an invitation. So I am the daughter of that house. It's just my own home. I don't need an invitation to go there. She said, Shiva, you know what happened last time. You know, if you have not been invited, best to not go there. So now here, what happens is that when we have a particular desire to do a particular thing and somebody tells us don't do it, what can be protection can seem as restriction. So what happened over here is Dakshani had this desire. So again, she felt this whole theme I'm going on is that the issue was one thing, but she saw it in some other way. So what did she say? She said, why does my husband not want me to go over here? Why is he restricting me like this? Why is he keeping me away from my family? And now Shiva's intention was let the tempers go down. Eventually things will be resolved. His point was not that he didn't, he, want to, he didn't want to alienate her or keep her away from her family. But his intention was just avoid further provocation. But when, whenever say somebody stops us from doing something, often we see that person, don't do like this, we see them as restricting us. So now how do we decide what is a restriction and what is protection? In a sense, if a child is told, don't go out of, you can play, but don't go out of this gate, play inside. The child might say, but why can't go outside? I want to play and there's so much bigger place to play outside. Now we understand that Yes, the child may not understand that the world is filled with so many different dangers. And those dangers uh, can befall on that child at any moment. But the child who is not aware of the dangers, at that time the child starts thinking, why, why, why are my parents so restrictive? So we could say that difference between restriction and protection is based on the perception of danger. So for the child, the place outside the courtyard, place outside the fence, is the place for enjoyment. Is the play, is the place for having fun. But for the parents, that is a place of danger. So when two, one person is saying, I want to do this, the other person is saying, no, don't do this. So often what happens, both of them get caught. I want to do this. No, you should not do this. But if you shift the vision outwards, as long as the parent is seeing the outside place as a place of danger and the child is seeing that as a place of fun, that conflict is not going to be resolved. And 
the child the parent may label the child as disobedient and the child may conceive the parent as domineering so basically it's not so much whenever we tell someone to do something see sometimes what happens for us it is very obvious why you should not do this but what is what is obvious for us may not be obvious for the other person so unless we explain our rationale why you are doing something and why you, why something should be done and why something should not be done things can sometimes just a certain instruction or a certain restriction can simply uh, alienate people from each other so prabhupad told one of his prominent disciples who was doing college outreach in america he said the worst when you are sharing krishna consciousness in the colleges in america he says the worst thing you can do is present krishna consciousness as a set of rules and regulations this this present krishna consciousness is a philosophy as a world view that helps us to make sense of life and once you do that then the rules and regulations will automatically make sense but if we don't tell that sometimes we can see the consequences of particular actions very easily but others can't so when whenever there is a misunderstanding or whenever there is a conflict no and we are telling somebody don't do this and they saying i want to do it so rather than just labeling the other person so the first point i said is that understand the need of the other person what is this person looking for the second point is understand the perception of the other person need is what do they need internally perception is how are they seeing externally so dakshayani saw that yagya ceremony as a place of getting together with her family says we are all it's a social occasion my family is organizing and i want to be with them but shiva saw that same place as a place for the aggravation of the existing conflict and whenever we talk often i, I tell you do this and they don't do this and what happens as long as we are we stay fixed in seeing things from our perspective and others just they just don't see our perspective so before we can actually tell someone what to do we have to at least try to explain to them what we are seeing and once we show them what we are seeing it's like say if there is a ditch over here but i can't see the ditch and i want to walk and you tell me don't walk over here but then why not now suppose it's not exactly a ditch it's a swamp and on top there is a nice grass but if i walk over there i'm going to fall into it then if you have some special lens by which you can see it then if you just offer me that lens have a look this is what i see and that's why i think you should do this can you look through this and i put on the lens oh i should not go here i should not go here so basically often again we we can easily you are not doing you are not listening to me you are not listening to me and we can label each other as domineering or disobedient or insubordinate or whatever but we need to understand their perception and then their perception may be correct and we may okay if you thinking it like that you can do it but their perception may not be correct it may be incomplete or it may be incorrect and then we need to we need to share our perception how we see things but unfortunately dakshayani did not see things that way and because she did not see things that way she said i am going to go there and when she went there she came there and her mother and her sisters greeted her very warmly but her father paid no attention to her at all and when that happened 
she felt so bitterly hurt by it. She, she did not want like effusive public display of affection, but just a simple human acknowledgement. But she did not get that from him. Sometimes silence can speak more than words. And sometimes silence can hurt more than words also. So, in, so especially uh, neglect. If somebody insults us, that's uh, somebody yells at us, that's bad. But if somebody neglects us, that can be even more painful. Because when they are yelling uh, at us, at least they are acknowledging our existence. <laughs> but if they neglect us, it's as if they don't, they don't, that we don't count at all. It can be unbearably painful. Sometimes, in every relationship, we have certain expectations of how the other person should act with us. And if we know somebody is our, somebody is our critic, somebody is our enemy, and then they speak harsh words at us, harsh words at us, they hurt, but we have come to expect that. We know this is what I am going to get from this person. But if somebody who we expect is our friend, our well-wisher, our supporter, and then that person doesn't speak any words in support for us. When the harshest words of our critics may not hurt us as much as the silence of our friends. So in this case, the silence of our father hurt her terribly. She had come. Now what happens? We are all, we are all very vulnerable. And generally we go through life by concealing our vulnerability. And to some extent that is required because the world is a tough place and everybody is uh, in this competitive world looking for weaknesses in others so that they can exploit those weaknesses. So in that sense, we have to put, we could say, a certain amount of shield around ourselves. By the age, we act tough. But still, there is this vulner vulnerability and weakness are two different things. Weakness means that we, we have some, say, lust, anger, greed, and we pride. These are some moral blemishes or moral flaws. Whereas vulnerability is somewhere, something where we can be hurt very easily. So vulnerability is just that somebody might have an image of self-confidence and self-sufficiency and power and we'll be impressed by that. But to connect at a heart-to-heart -heart level, we need to see that person as a human being. And to see them as a human being means we need to see their vulnerabilities. So that's why we see Krishna in Vrindavan doesn't act as God. God doesn't need anything from anyone. God is omnipotent. And then in every relationship, we want to feel needed to some extent. Not in an egoistic sense, but we, we want to feel needed. Yes, I can contribute over here. I can do something over here. And to, if we don't feel needed at all, then we start thinking, what am I doing in this relationship? So, so for a devotee to connect very closely with the Lord, even the Lord conceals his omnipotence. And we could say he reveals his vulnerability. His vulnerability is what? He, when he feels hungry, he goes to Mother Yashoda and he says, I am hungry, give me some food. And seeing his vulnerability creates an upswelling of affection 
within her heart. And she comes closer to him. So if we sometimes feel that we want to come closer to someone, then we need to put our shield aside. And we need to share our concerns, our vulnerabilities. And then the other person may also reciprocate and share their vulnerabilities. And that's how we come closer to each other. The point I'm making here is that we all have vulnerabilities. And now when Dakshayani had come over here, she had actually put herself in a very vulnerable position. Because it is a social occasion and not only was her husband not with her, she had actually gone against the will of her husband and come over there. And she had done that for what? To be with her father and her family. So she had already gone against her husband's will and then she saw her father did not even acknowledge her. So that hurt her terribly. So what, nah, what happened over here is, that the point, this is the third point, that when understand people's vulnerabilities to help them, not hurt them. So, but when, when we are relating with each other, sometimes some people share something which is very confidential, which is very private, which has been maybe like a harrowing experience in their life. Or they might be going through an experience. And if at that time we help them a little bit, they will be forever grateful for us, to, to us. And if at that time we neglect them, it can be a terrible, terrible uh, strain or a wound in the relationship. It is just like, say, if I tell someone, can I have a glass of water? And if somebody gives a glass of water, I'll say, thank you, I'm grateful. But suppose I'm in a desert, and in the desert I somehow am stumbling, and I come to a house, and I'm dying of thirst, and I knock on the door, can I have a glass of water? And at that time somebody gives, the glass of water is the same, but there the vulnerability is much more. So, at that time, when somebody is vulnerable, at that time, giving something or not giving something can matter much, much more than at other times. That's why, now, generally people don't reveal their vulnerabilities at once. It's only when close relationships or with people whom they trust, they start slowly revealing their vulnerabilities. And if we use the knowledge of someone's vulnerability to hurt them, then that's almost like uh, sounding the death knell of that relationship. Because when the vulnerability is revealed, and we, it's like they are trusting us. And at that time, if, if we use the knowledge of their vulnerability not to help them, but to hurt them, then that that is like a betrayal and then the, the, the relationship will just completely clamp down and that is precisely what happened over here. Now Daksha obviously saw that Dakshayani has come without Shiva but still he neglected her, still he neglected her and when he neglected her, she felt completely desolate over there. The most, we all feel lonely at times. But the sometimes, but loneliness is of different kinds. Hey, somebody, sometimes you may hear of some stories where somebody is lost on an island with nobody around and they don't have anyone to talk with. Well, having no human beings around you is one kind of loneliness. But an even more painful loneliness comes when we feel when we are surrounded with people who don't value us and who don't understand us. That's extremely painful. That's sometimes somebody might be in a crowded metro train with maybe 
hundreds of people around them but they might be lonely because in that crowded situation everybody is like a fragmented being there's no connection so nobody really may be valuing anyone else nobody may be understanding anyone else so at that time in her vulnerability when he did not pay attention to her he neglected her that hurt terribly now we all are caught in our own thoughts and we are all caught in our own desires we are caught in our own concerns and that's understandable we all have many issues which we are dealing with but at the same time when somebody has a when somebody we know they have a particular issue or they have a particular problem they have a particular vulnerability and if they approach us at that time at that time we need to get out of ourselves get out of our own small world and do what is required for them but if we don't get out of our world then it can be a big problem so many times it happens that say when we give a class sometimes i have seen i speak something and some devotees after come that this was like a life changing class for me really said i didn't think i spoke anything life changing <laughs> but what happens sometimes krishna may use us to speak and then i ask them what was the life changing point and did they mention some point and that point was not even a point i had prepared in the class <laughs> it was just like i was speaking some other point and while that speaking some other point i just mentioned that as a passing reference some additional point but that's what struck them so what happens sometimes krishna may use us to address somebody else's need when they need it and if somebody is particularly vulnerable at that time if we can assist them it can be a enormous help so now here it's important to recognize that different people have different vulnerabilities and to understand each other means to understand you know, where is this person particularly vulnerable and if we are to be in a relationship we need to protect each other okay this is your vulnerability i'll protect you here this is my vulnerability i'll protect you here but if we don't do that then we we in a sense uh, wound the trust in a way that might be almost irrevocable and this brings me to the last point so that about we can have question answers and further feedback also further discussion on this but i started earlier by talking about how we have different dimensions in our relationships so then so the, the last point is that why would daksha neglect his own daughter like this in fact daksha he felt very very disappointed almost devastated when she saw that her father neglected her but then as the yagya ceremony was starting she saw that not only was she neglected but shiva had also been neglected there was for all the devtas there is a section of the sacrifice and even if a particular devta is not there the sacrifice portion has to be given for those devotees the sacrifices are at different levels sometimes the sacrifices performed it's performed by a great person or a great, great uh, or it is very well performed then the devotees may come personally and receive the sacrifice but other times the devotees may not come personally but still if the sacrifice is done properly according to the proper chanting of mantras and proper practices then the devtas invisibly accept that portion of the sacrifice but to not offer that sacrifice itself that is outrageous and when she when dakshari saw this she felt so utterly rejected that she felt not only 
Is my fa father not respecting me, not even acknowledging me? He's not even acknowledging my husband. And at that time, she decided, she told Daksha that, you know, you, Shiva is such a flawless person, but what are you doing? You are finding fault in a person who is this flawless. We have multiple relationships. We could say that whenever we form a relationship, say a husband-wife relationship, you know, that is like a that is a primary bonding. Like across generations, there can be a relationship between parents and children. That's a secondary bonding. And for her, she saw that this is my primary relationship. And he's completely rejecting me over here. Rejecting me and rejecting my husband. She said that because you are such a wild disrespecter of great people, I want to have no connection with you. I want to have no connection with you. And then she sat in a mystic posture and she decided to end her life. Now, when she sat in that posture, everybody understood what she was about to do. Even Daksha understood that. But he did nothing to stop her. How can it be? So normally, even if a stranger is say about to commit suicide, if we see somebody about to commit suicide, we'll try to deter them, stop them, you know, don't do this. They want to speak of one's own daughter, how could he become so callous? That is because of how he was seeing her. So she saw that this is my home, this is my father. But Daksha stopped seeing her as his daughter. She saw her, he saw her as what? As Shiva's wife. And because he saw her as Shiva's wife, and Shiva is the person who disrespected me. Therefore, for me, she is now a means to get back at Shiva. Because she disres he, dis he disrespected me, so I will neglect his wife. So, actually, this is, uh, this is the last point which is quite important to make sense of why people deal with us in a particular way. That is, understand which category people are putting you in, which framework people are putting you in. So when, whenever we all deal with each other, we put everyone in a particular framework. Say, oh, this is an Indian. Then we may talk in Indian language with them. Oh, this is a New Zealand, this is a Kiwi. Then we'll talk, we'll talk with English with them. If this is a particular, if you see a particular person from a particular part of India, we might talk with them in a particular language. And it's not just language; it could be gender. If somebody is a child, maybe a small fire, we might talk with them in a different way. If somebody is an adult, we'll talk with them in a different way. So, for a functional perspective, we often put people in certain categories, and that kind of categorization is essential for functioning. Otherwise, how would we know? how to deal with people but what happens when people when we put each other in categories you now what category who is putting us in we may not always understand that properly so so daksha she was she was putting is my father but she was not putting her, her he was not putting her in the category that you are my daughter so quite often when people deal with us, they are not, the way they deal with us is often not about us. <clears throat> it's about some categorized category in which they have put us. And they just see us as a member of that category. But, now, we might be a member of that category, but we might be a member of some other category also. So basically, this point is when others treat us in an inappropriate way, in a rude way or in an angry way, it's helpful to not take others' actions personally. 
And you say, how can I? We are personal. We are personalists. You know? We are all personalists. We are, meant, we are meant to. We do treat God as a person. We treat each other as persons. How can we not take each other's actions personally? But the point is, often people's actions, although they are directed at us, they are not necessarily about us. So, when we take others' actions personally, that is the time we start overreacting. So, in this case, Daksha have become so completely cold-hearted. It is, sometimes people fear that if I become too spiritual, I will become too detached. And if I become detached, then I will not care for anyone. Yeah, it is possible that detachment can make us uncaring. But actually the opposite can also make us uncaring. If we are too attached to someone, then we care for us. We, are, we care for that person or that thing and then we don't care for anything else at all. So Daksha was so attached to his own prestige and to his own feeling that I have been disrespected. That he didn't care even for a life of the life of someone. So at that time, if some person might some person might behave in a terrible way with us, but we often might end up taking something personally when it is not about us so much. Everybody has their own issues going on in, inside them. And when they sp even they speak to us, it's like in inside everybody's head there's a movie going on. And in that movie, they are the stars. And everybody else is an extra. Is an extra. Say, now what happens, say, imagine, and I think now the Cricket World Cup is going on, so the cricket mania is there, at least in India. Sometimes in India you see young people, they're walking along the road and suddenly they start, <laughs> they start bowling or they start batting. Now there is no cricket field, there is no ball, there is no bat, but the match is going on in their head. The match is going on in their head and they are thinking that they are the next Virat Kohli or they are the next uh, some, some champion bowler or whatever. And they are playing. Now somebody who sees from the outside perspective, what is this? But at least we understand, okay, this, is, this person must be cricket mad. But if somebody didn't know about cricket, they would say, what's going on? So, so, when they are swinging their actions like this, suppose somebody is there in front of them. And you think, are you going to beat me with a stone? <laughs> well, they are not going to beat him with a stone. Now, it might also happen that they move his hand and their hand goes and hits someone. Now, obviously, they are hitting someone. It is a matter of concern. And proper action has to be taken. But it is not personal. So what happens when we take things too personally, then we start going into insecurity about ourselves. And maybe I did something wrong. Not It is one thing to think I did something wrong. It is quite another thing to think that maybe something is wrong with me. And even worse is that something is so wrong with me that it can never be fixed. And that is how People can just plummet into feelings of unworthiness, unlovability, and then just feel like I can't go on. I can't go on my life at all. So, so small issues can become very big if we start taking things too personally. So now, how can we avoid taking people things personally? Just by understanding that all the people may be doing something to us, it is not necessarily to us personally. It is, they are putting us in some category. And it is that category that they think they are hitting out at. So when we have this, we can develop a little more resilience. And ultimately for us, when we understand that we are souls who are developing a relationship with Krishna, so now these broadly four principles that I talked about, understand other person's need, understand other person's perception, understand <coughs> the other person's categorization, how, in what category they are putting us in. So ultimately, 
वी नीड अ सेंस ऑफ स्पिरिचुअल सेल्फ वर्थ स्पिरिचुअल सेल्फ वर्थ मीन्स दैट वी आर ऑल souls who are parts of krishna and irrespective of how people deal with us krishna still loves us krishna still cares for us and krishna's love for us is not based on who we are it is based on who he is he is the all loving lord of everyone we may have done many bad things in our lives and we may do many bad things also in future of course we don't want to do bad things but we might we might do but no matter how many wrong things we have done we don't we can never do anything which will which will make krishna leave us and go away krishna will never abandon us that krishna is very close to us do you know how far krishna is from us what do you think is inside us so how far is he inside is very close yes krishna is just one thought away from us at any time any place if we just try to think of him in a devotional way we can start feeling his presence now of course we need relationships in this world also so we could say we have horizontal relationships and we have vertical relationships so we need the vertical relationship may not substitute for a horizontal relationship we can't say i'll relate with krishna only and i don't care about people around me i don't care whether people care about me or not it doesn't work like that but the vertical relationship can give us stability so that even if there are ups and downs in our horizontal relationships we can deal with them we can weather those storms generally if we have some anchor say if waves are coming in an ocean and when the wave is coming if i try to fight the wave the one wave come i try to force fight it how can i fight it how long can i fight it but if we hold on to an anchor once we hold on to the holding on to the anchor is much easier than fighting the waves so similarly waves of respect and disrespect loneliness and connectedness and waves of ups and downs in our relationships will come but if we stay connected with the lord then what will happen is no matter how much we strong with the waves we won't get swept away so our relationship with krishna is our greatest asset it greatest asset doesn't mean that it substitutes for the other relationships but it gives us strength by which we can weather the storms in the other relationships and thus when we strengthen ourselves by connecting with krishna and connecting with krishna is not a ritual oh i just chant hari krishna i'll go to a satsang all this is good but we have to find out ourselves how best can i connect with krishna something which reminds us of krishna something which gives us a personal inspiration to connect with krishna if we do that then we will realize and we will feel krishna's presence we will feel the connection coming from krishna's presence in our lives feel that strength and that will help us not overreact when people around us seem to let us down or act in strange ways and this way by understanding krishna's love for us other principles we can start applying in a more mature way and that way the vertical relationship can help us strengthen our horizontal relationship and thus we can move forward in our day to day lives so i'll summarize i spoke today on the theme of principles for improving our relationships and i started by talking about the story of daksha i began by saying that when we study scripture uh, there can be many different things which might seem at different levels of believability or unbelievability but the focus of scripture is not on matter but on what matters so what matters means if i look at this room what matters to us is 
not exactly how many tube lights are there or how many patches are there on the wall or the ce ceilings. It's what will help us along the, what will get us along the way and what will get in our way. So similarly, if we study scripture to understand what matters, how can we act in our lives and how we can not act so that it doesn't get us into trouble. Dharma, that is the essential guideline that scripture gives us. So I talked about the story of Daksha Prajapati and his daughter Dakshayani. So when Daksha was disrespected, he overreacted. And it was not even disrespect, it was a perceived disrespect. Because he was doing the religious ceremony not to please God, but to pander to his own ego, for his own prestige. So when Shiva didn't get up, he took it very ill, he overreacted to it. So often the underlying theme of all that I talked about was that when people complain about a headache, they may often have a stomachache. So his overreaction, he is going on a tirade against Shiva, was not just because Shiva did not get up at that time. He felt that Shiva, intensely felt Shiva was unworthy. And he saw Shiva as his inferior, not as a superior. Not that he was one of the primal gods, but that he is my son-in-law and therefore junior to me. And when people get angry, if we try to, instead of just responding to their actions, if we try to understand their need, then we can respond better to them. So then I talked about how later on in Parvati wanted to go back to the, go for, for the next ceremony, next fire sacrifice, Shiva told her don't go. And still she went. So, you know, we all, sometimes some, something might be told, some instruction might be for our protection, but we might see it as a restriction. And that led to the second point, understand people's perceptions. So a child might see the area outside the fence as a place of fun, for fun, but the parents might see the place of danger. So as long as the perceptions are different, communications can't be effective. So to enhance this perception, sometimes we ask them, we can ask them, you know, why do you want to do this? Or why, why do you feel I should not do this? Rather than saying, I will do it, I will not do it. Rather, you should do it, you should not do it. We try to understand each other's perception. Then that can help us arrive at better, better, better understanding of each other. Then I talked about, when Parvati went there, she, she was very vulnerable but because she had left her husband and come there. And at that time when Daksha neglected her, she just couldn't bear it. There is silence can speak louder than the loudest words at times. And she felt so betrayed, she felt utterly rejected by that. So generally to come closer to each other, we need to understand each other's vulnerabilities and then help each other, not hurt each other by knowing those vulnerabilities. So even God puts himself from an invulnerable, omnipotent position to vulnerable position to facilitate closer relationships. So once we understand each other's vulnerabilities and then help them at that time, that can create such a close bonding. It's like giving somebody water when they are dying of thirst can connect, can, can, will be seen as a far greater service than just giving water normally. So, although we might be lost in our own head, our lives, but if somebody is vulnerable, if we get out of our heads and understand their vulnerabilities and help them when they are vulnerable, that will go a long time, long way in helping the relationship, but if, in strengthening the relationship, but in the vulnerability, if we neglect, that will be bad, but if we use the vulnerability to hurt them, that will be like a betrayal and that can destroy the relationship. And then lastly, when Daksha became so cold-hearted that, that Sati <coughs> Dakshayani was ready to lay down, end her life and still he did not stop. So the last point I said is, don't take each other's actions pers personally, others' actions personally. Understand how they are categorizing us. So sometimes we, she, Sati thought that this is my father, but Daksha saw is not my father. He is not my daughter. She is Shiva's wife. So if we start seeing that when people are acting, they might be putting us in some other category entirely from what we are putting us. Then we won't take their actions so personally. 
everybody has a movie going inside their head and in that movie they we often just to be extras they are the stars so <coughs> if we understand that then we can avoid taking their actions to personally or overreacting to them and to be able to do this then i talked about our strengthening our vertical relationship with krishna people may leave us or people may not some may some let us down but krishna will never leave us and krishna is just one thought away from us so if you find out how we can connect our thoughts with krishna do find out those devotional activities by which we can easily direct our thoughts towards krishna then we will have the inner strength by which we can weather whatever storms come upon us in our relationships and move forward more steadily thank you very much hare krishna so any questions or comments yes please Okay. I was just thinking that you know you have told us four principles for understanding the relationships. Sometimes in real life relationships, in spite of making your best efforts to understand the other person's desires, their perceptions, their their needs, still you are not able to to, to improve. the relationship the bitterness still remains there then in that case can we presume that it has uh, something to do with our previous janma or maybe what we have brought from the previous life and and maybe accept it as a prarabdha and and and, uh, and move on and yeah. stop making any any efforts for further improvement okay if despite our best efforts to try to improve a relationship if things don't improve then can we start can we say you know, this is our something from our past karma prarabdha karma yes certainly it, we have to very be very careful about how we use this attitude because <coughs> A destiny can become a very convenient excuse for irresponsibility also that means that you know this person this time to be like this and why should i waste my time and effort so it could be but we shouldn't presume that to be the explanation as you rightly said that we need to try our best and sometimes it may be that uh, even if it's distant first of all we should see if there is something which can be explained in immediate terms immediate terms did i do something wrong is this person thinking something about me which may not be true so quite often conflicts come in relationships because two people are trading in different currencies and suppose you give me something very valuable and then i give i pay you in indian national rupees but no if you were expecting payment in new zealand dollars and he say hi what is this suppose you did not know no 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 anything about inr say you know, i give you something valuable and you just give me some paper right and you will be annoyed with me and i say i gave you something so valuable it's more than enough for this thing so two people may be trading in different currencies now what do i mean by currencies in terms of relationships different people value different things for some people the most important thing is say the time that you spend with them it's like a father the father might say his child wants to play we as young son who wants to play cricket and the father may say you know i will get the most expensive bat the most expensive pads the most expensive cricket equipment for you and that's how the father is expressing affection for the son but 
the son may want you know i don't want an expensive bat when i am playing for my team i want you to be there and watch my play and father says no i i have to get this expensive equipment for you i have to work so hard that i can't come for the match so the father feels that father is expressing love by giving some well expensive gifts but the son wants that love in terms not of the things but the presence so both of them they do love each other but they are trading in different currencies so in general if in a relationship we are finding roadblocks then we can try to check whether we are trading in different currencies now how do we know which currency somebody is trading in broadly you can say look at two things one is what is it that we don't do if we don't do the other person keeps complaining for a long time mm-hmm. as in washington dc about a couple of months ago and after sunday class one devotee asked a question he said is uh, he said do women have a very long memory <laughs> when somebody asks a question like this it's a loaded question <laughs> so he said you know i you know my wife constantly keeps reminding me of something i did not do in 1977 <laughs> so then i told him that if she is still remembering that that means it's, it was so important for her so now of course we are not able to fix that right now it's 40 50 years gone now right but the point is if somebody keeps complaining a lot about something then rather than saying why do you make such a big thing about such a small thing understand that that is the currency they are trading in and then try to even if we can't address that at that time try to address it now and the other way to understand it is what is it if we do they appreciate it a lot so sometimes the we might just we might value the other person but we may never speak the words of appreciation i was just talking with one devotee and um, he he became a devotee and his wife and he decided to marry then he married in his own community and his wife had no idea about bhakti at all and then he uh, she was from a like in from bihar from a remote background from village background and her parents told her whatever your husband do you do that so then almost for 10 12 years they have been practicing bhakti together now then i asked him he said did you ever thank your wife for supporting you for taking up the bhakti which you took up the our practices of bhakti are quite serious it's not just like let's say and some names of ram which and so many round for for prasad to krishna it's quite a quite a chee that somebody have to make to practice I said no he said why should i thank her she is my wife she is supposed to do this so i said no no for her it was significant change and if she had not done this how much trouble it would have been for you and he said i told her you go back home you tell her this and next time he is in india in mumbai so i told him next time when i meet you i'm going to ask you whether you do it or not so i told him that and after a few weeks although i was in america at that time he sent me a message he said i told this to my wife and he says i have never seen her as happy as she was when i told her this so for him it was just a few words of acknowledgement of appreciation but when he did that it is a big thing for her so for her those words of appreciation that was the currency in which she was trading so basically first we understand and try to address that understand the currency in which they are trading and then afterwards gradually we can also tell the other person what is the currency in which we are trading that means and this is very important for me you know if you don't if this is not done then i feel as if you don't care for me instead of just complaining why don't you do this 
you keep forgetting it, you keep neglecting. So once we start understanding each other's currencies, then it becomes relate. Even a very bitter relationship can at least become less bitter. And as far as the prarabdha is concerned, even in that, even if something is destined, but it may not be destined for life. Just like so many things in our life, sometimes in our job, we go through a difficult phase. We might be just working as well as we were working earlier, but suddenly, you know, a good project is taken away from us. We don't get a good appraisal. So sometimes just as in our job, we might go to bad phases, despite we not doing much. And then the bad phase changes, and then things improve after that. So similarly, in our relationships also, we might go through a bad phase. So, so no, no, so no, no. But the point I'm making is that that bad phase may not be permanent. So, if we start thinking, oh, this is destined to be like this, and this person is destined to be like this, then we may stop trying. So, I would say stop trying means that we don't care at all for the relationship. In every relationship, there is an obligatory part and there is a voluntary part. If we, in a particular relationship, the obligatory part say we have to take care of the take care of something at home, take care of finances, take care of certain things. The voluntary part is where we connect at an emotional level, personal level, share our vulnerabilities. So we might not do the voluntary part so much if we are not getting a proper reciprocation or connection. But at least the obligatory part we keep doing. And if, if we stop doing that, then what will happen? Even if that destined phase ends, Still by our actions, by our negligence, we may have created so much rupture that it may be impossible to repair that. That's why we do our part and this is where karmanneva dikaraste ma faleshu kadachana that we are not just serving that person, we are, not just, we are actually serving Krishna through that person. So that way we can move on. But certainly if we don't get reciprocation, we can lower our expectations. But not stop trying entirely. Does that answer your question? Any other questions or comments? Yes, Anthony. Thank you so much for the lecture. The lecture was really nice. Um, I have two questions, actually. So, basically, on uh, the routine life that I have seen, and that's really general questions. The one thing that you just mentioned that keep trying to make sure that you improve your relationship, you know, and just not stop by saying that, oh, this person can't improve or just make perception in your mind. But my question is that you have a fight, say, somehow between husband and wife, right? And you settle down that fight saying that, okay, fine, I won't repeat that thing again in the future, and then the fight just stops there. But then later on, maybe after a month, you know, or maybe a couple of months later, they do fight again on some other topic. And that, that conversation, the other person reminds me, you know, mm -hmm. the person that, oh, remember that you did this mistake last time and I forget you, and now you just did this one, and then the fight becomes a big thing, you know. So how one can improve on that thing? So that's my first question. And the second one is that you have a terms, bad terms with someone, and you really want to improve that thing with the person, but the other person doesn't want to talk to you, but then that person keeps talking negative about you to the other person and keep doing that, whether you know that he, is, he or she is doing that for you. So how you tackle that situation, because that situation is really hard, yeah. and that makes you irritate so well that she just wants to go and smash her face or his face and say that, why you are doing this? If you don't want to talk to me, then keep your mouth shut. Mm. So the first question is about say people bring up the past incidents in every future interaction. Yes, you know, sometimes close relationships make us excellent scorekeepers. <laughs> you know, oh, you did like that at that time, you did like that at that time, you did like that at that time. So actually, it's uh, ultimately relationships are not meant for us to get even. It is to get along. No, you did this to me, so I will do this to you now. 
So uh, two, three things we could do to deal with this is all of us have certain hurts which we come, keep concealed within us. And if some things are really strongly there, then we need some some healthy forum where we can express that. Maybe uh, once a month or once a fortnight or once in a few months, you know, we just cut us cut out the world and spend time with each other. And not just spend time accusing each other, but uh, try to do some activity which bonds us together. Maybe read some spiritually uplifting work or go to some peaceful place. And then, once we have created that stability, that foundation of stability, then bring up some issues, not in an accusative way, but just a way of expressing the concerns. Because what happens, uh, sometimes some wounds, some hurts are minor, and we just let that, we just forget it and time lets it heal them. But sometimes some hurts, we conceal them, but they are not minor, or they stay on, and they surface again. Anger, when it is, when we restrict it inside our heart, just like a certain objects, if we bury them inside the ground, then they become fossils, fossil fuel, and that can be burned. So, like that, anger, when it is buried inside us, it grows into hatred. So, anger is very hot headed. It's like very impulsive. But hatred is cold blooded. Hatred means basically we know the other person's vulnerability and then hit where it hurts. So that can be very painful. So it's best if such hurts are there, we address them properly or have at least try to create a forum where they can be addressed properly. And then as much as possibly avoid bringing them up. Now, the other person brings them up also. If we can have a forum like this, maybe depending on order frequency, where we can have honest connection with each other, then that helps a lot. Apart from that, if we could also recognize that sometimes when we all get angry, it's like when we get angry, we start uh, just trying to hit the other person with whatever comes in our hands. Sometimes physically we might throw some objects, but we physically we don't throw that, but verbally we throw accusations. We throw something. So when that happens, again, if we, if we stick to the issue at hand, it's like they are saying, this, uh, this, saying this issue, this issue, this issue. But let's focus on addressing the issue at hand. Then at least at that time the issue can be addressed. But if we get carried away, you bring this up and I'll bring that up. And then you bring that up and then you bring that up. Then the small thing becomes very big. So those two things, that having some healthy forum for addressing, so that those hurts don't get buried, buried inside us. And secondly, trying to stick to the issue at that time. Okay, even if the other person, okay, that's okay, let's discuss that later. Let's focus on this right now. So then we can minimize the escalation of the issues. Okay, and then as far as the second question about <coughs> what was the second question? Sorry. If you want to improve relationship. Yeah, if you want to improve relationship, the other person keeps speak, speaking uh, negative about us to others. Yeah, broadly there are three options for us when this happens. One is confrontation, second is clarification, third is neglect. What do I mean that confrontation means? We just go to the other person and not confront in, a, a confront in the sense of accusing, but confront in the sense that mm, we can just, if they are telling a particular version of what happened. It quite happens often whenever you hear a story, there are there are usually three sides of the story. My side, your side, and the right side. 
<laughs> so what happens is that at now now they might actually be feeling that that's the way it is. So instead of sometimes you might refer to that, why are you speaking like this about me? That can just become like we are accusing them. And then they become defensive and then we start fighting over that. But instead of that, we could just in a completely uh, you could say non-emotional way say to this incident had happened and this is what had happened in that day. So we needn't even refer to that person that he was speaking like this about me. But just tell this to this is what had happened. And then you say, no, no, it was not like this, or I heard like this. Then that gives us the opportunity to clarify. As soon as we start any discussion that we start with, why are you doing like this? What happens is it immediately becomes uh, it becomes it's most likely to get we are attacking that person, and then they will retaliate. So we could start it with, and this is how it happened. In general, say if we cut our hair, hair has no nerves. So cutting hair is not that painful. But say if, sh if somebody is shaving and while cutting the hair, they cut skin, then blood comes out, it's more painful. But sometimes say when you are when somebody is giving an incision, then when they are take, taking blood out, if they cut a nerve, it pains much more. So the closer we get to the nerve, the greater is the pain. So for all of us, we, the rightness of our actions, the rightness of our understandings, as soon as somebody accuses that our actions are wrong or our understanding also is wrong, that's cutting too close to the nerve. And when we cut too close to the nerve, the pain is so much that we react to the pain more than to the intent. Now the doctor might be cutting maybe to just take some blood test or whatever. But we react to that. So whenever we have to, whenever if somebody is speaking something wrong about us also, it's, it's best if we can avoid cutting close to the nerve. It's not very easy, but if you understand this principle, instead of saying that, why are you speaking like this about me? Okay, this was what happened in the situation. Then we say, no, no, but this also happened. Oh, okay, yeah. But this was how it was. So that's that's one way we can con can confront, not in a confrontationalist way, but confront in the sense of just talk with them. If that if they are not ready to listen to uh, us at all, the second option could be that clarification. That means that leads to some people who are important for us. We can tell that this is what actually happened. This is what is being told, but this was what happened. So now we cannot do clarification for everyone. Sometimes that just makes things worse. But a few important people who really matter for us, we can clarify to them. And third is neglect. Neglect means that some that what happens, even if people speak negative about us, this is Kaliyuga. Kaliyuga means everybody's memory is very short. <laughs> so and everybody is looking for you could say the latest gossip. So if some, right now what they are speaking about us that is the latest gossip and it's fresh right now. But as soon as some new gossip comes up we will become old news and it will go away. So we don't have to worry too much about it and moreover what happens? Although if people hear something about us, they might hold it against us temporarily. That might cause some reservation. But overall, people are going to uh, deal with us based primarily on how we deal with them. So if in the long run, if they see our actions are not the way they have heard about us, then it'll, they, will, they will not hold those conceptions too strongly against us. And if they are going to do that, then maybe you know, we don't need to have too close relationship with people who are that judgmental. Not that we reject them, but then we don't have to worry too much if somebody just, if we try to cultivate a relationship with someone, we are nice with them. And based on one thing they hear about us, just reject everything about us and they are judging us. That they are not really the kind of people whom we can count on. And we need not spend too much time on how they perceive us. 
basically that person is so the, the, if we, we try to confront them so that we change their understanding or we clarify so that we can change the understanding of some people who are important to us or we neglect and just continue our way of normal living and our actions will gradually either just the passage of passage of time will change and that will become old news or our actions will speak louder in the world and things will be adjusted. Does that answer your question? Yes. Is confronting a devotee a Vaishnava Prad? See, sometimes we become very paranoid about what is an offense. Offenses, there can be various degrees of offenses. Now, one level of offense, it is said if you see a devotee and you are not happy, that is also an offense. <laughs> now that is very difficult especially if we are interacting regularly with some person and doing services with them then we see them and we know they are going to give you some service we will not feel happy at that time but that is like a very minor offense the really serious offenses are where we have some envy in our heart and we want to pull down the other person say if we are a good singer and somebody else also is a good singer and then people start praising that person. And when everybody is praising, he's such a good singer. You say, Have you seen how much prasad he eats? <laughs> 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 so, what are we doing? We are doing something to pull down the other person. Of course, you could say, How much prasad he eats? It's harmless, but sometimes there can be much more, much harsher aspersions that can be cast also. So, the point is that we have to see. Especially if you are not pulling down someone, we are just, just communicating, then that, that confrontation is not an offense. Although they might feel that way, but uh, we have to function in our moment. And one aspect of functioning is Guhiya Makhyati Puchyati. We have to open our heart and speak it to others, and the other person also has to hear our heart being spoken. So if we if something is hurting us quite a bit and that is occupying a place in our heart and if we don't open that heart then we are not having that loving exchange now this particular exchange might not be loving because there is a lot of tension in it but the point is this kind of tension when it's resolved only then loving exchanges will be possible so opening our heart is also part of a loving exchange so if our intent is not to attack the other person then that's not an offense offenses Primarily when we are trying to pull down the other person. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Thai Gaur Prema Anandi. Is great Shri Prabhupada ki, Jai.